Good afternoon and welcome to the final session of this side event, Science for a Water Secure World in a Changing Environment, a contribution to United Nations Water Conference 2023. My name is Anil Misra, I'm Chief of Section Hydrological System, Climate Change and Adaptation. Uh, after having two keynote speeches and then a two panel session, which discussed about power, science policy interface and um, education capacity development. Now we are going to really revisit scientific component that needs to come up uh, so that the scientific feedback can be provided to the Water Conference 2023. We have heard lots of uh, historical landmark today, and it's a time to look at what science can contribute. I would like to read the IHP9 vision before we start talking about science research and innovation panel. IHP9 vision states a water secure world where people and institution have adequate capacity and scientifically based knowledge for informed decision making on water management and governance to attain sustainable development and to build resilient society. So for, with that vision, how uh, this panel can come up with some of the reflection that can lead us to ISP implementation, but also to uh, Water Conference 2023. Our panel will try to address how can science and innovation help acceleration of the implementation of water-related uh, Agenda 2030, SDGs, and other agendas. Um, what is the role of what UNESCO Water Family um, for, for the implementation of IHP-9 and scientific, um, um, uh, how can water science influence people's livelihood, particularly using citizen science, but also considering open science recommendation. Um, and what are the main messages that UNESCO should bring to 2023 water conference in relation to water sciences? So within those, five set of questions our panelists will try to give us some of the feedback. Let me introduce our panelists. Uh, we have in our panel today, uh, Mr. Taikan Oki, Special Advisor to President University of Tokyo, Japan, who already gave keynote presentation. And um, Professor Oki demonstrated the connection between global hydrological cycle, renewable freshwater sources, climate change, global economy, and sustainability. He has been also lead author of IPCC, uh, AR5, and he was until recently senior vice rector of the United Nations University. Uh, also as a capacity of assistant secretary general to the United Nations. Uh, we have, uh, Panelist, uh, Mr. Christopher Kudenek, a professor of hydrology with 25 years of experience, particularly in risk interface across variability, uh, variety, uh, hydroclimate and geographical settings. Um, professor Anne Van Grinsven from Verge University and already UNESCO chair also. It's in progress. It's in progress. Um, um, she has uh, more than um, 15 years of experience, research experience in the field of water quality, hydrological modeling. And also uh, she recently uh, implemented a project also with UNESCO, an e-masters program in engineering and hydrology and engineering. We have uh, Professor Maciej Zaleski, Director of European Center for Ecohydrology, Poland. I would like to recognize his great contribution to UNESCO IHP over the last 30 years. He started contributing actually Man and the Biosphere Program, a sister program, intergovernmental sister program. Uh, and the concept of ecohydrology, nature-based solution, which has been highlighted thanks to Professor Zalewski's contribution. He, uh, he was also instrumental to bring uh, ecohydrology uh, initiative uh, and also ecohydrology demonstration sites. So I would like to recognize his contribution, uh, which has been again recognized this morning by keynote speakers. 
um, only way forward. Uh, one of the solutions they provided, nature-based solutions, so thank you very much for your contribution to um, science of hydrology, but also IHP. We have panelists with us uh, from, from the distance, from online. Uh, Nilay Dugulu is a uh, enthusiast for science in form operational hydrology. She has been very active in IAHS young hydrology processes. She currently works as a consultant for Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center, and she has acted as the early career scientist representative for the European Geoscience Union, EGU. Thank you, Nile, for your um, acceptance to our invitation. She is connected from Turkey, if I'm not mistaken. Next, uh, our colleagues and friends for many years, um, Professor Magali Garcia Cardenas from Bolivia. She's a Bolivian agronomist engineer. She has degrees from uh, Belgium, from, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, a master's degree and PhD from Belgium. And she's also uh, providing lots of support to UNESCO IHP, particularly in the recent context of citizen science, indigenous knowledge, and she has been our collaborator for many, many years. Thank you, Magali, for connecting from Bolivia, I think from La Paz. And finally, last but not least, Dr. Mark Smith, Director General, International Water Management Institute, Sri Lanka. I think he's connected from Colombo. Um, Dr. Smith has been Director General of EMI since 2020. He was formerly Deputy Director General. And prior to that, he was uh, with uh, uh, IUCN and Nature Conservation. He has a doctorate in Ecology and Resource Management from University of Edinburgh and Masters in Climatology from um, Climatology. So with these distinguished panelists, we will start um, uh, their views on those five set of questions that I highlighted in the beginning. We'll start with uh, Christophe Kudenek, Secretary General, International Association of uh, Hydrological, International Association of Scientific Hydrology. Christophe, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Anil. Um, Thanks, Anil Abu, um, UNESCO team, for the invitation. I have, I have been invited to provide some slides, if you can display, please. And so, yes, as you said, I'm professor of hydrology in France and, and speaking here today uh, uh, in my capacity of Secretary General of AHS, International Association of Hydrological Sciences, which is a strong partner of UNESCO AHP since the beginning. AHS is part of IUGG, itself part of the International Science Council. It is the, the association dealing with hydrological sciences in, the, in, that, in that setting. And we are celebrating its 100th anniversary uh, this year. Slide, please. So just, I'd like to, I'd like to I, I use the slide because I'd like to, to, to display some ideas along the time arrow. Um, the United Nations uh, took uh, consciousness of the water issues at the end of the, well, long time ago, but in the 90s, they formulated the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, which ended in 2015, but Two or three years before the end, the synthesis of the MDGs has been done and the, 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 the new awareness of the situation and the challenges and the crisis was uh, um, um, put into, into synthesis, uh, multilateral synthesis in the document called The Future We Want, and then it had been translated into a roadmap towards the Horizon 2030, which is Agenda 2030, with the Sustainable Development Goals that we all know. And so now we are in 2022, in particular looking at the conference in 2023 in New York next March, and towards the 2030 Horizon. Slide, please. And so, as has been said since this morning, and as we are all aware, science, 
science has always fed, always fed uh, such processes of uh, policy making, action, multi multilateral diplomacy, etc. Now we are talking about how to increase coherence and policy and of actions, how to accelerate them, how to monitor the progress with indicators about targets, and how to facilitate the actions with education and capacity. And all the morning has been focused on that. And of course, part of science from before could be uh, used to fit that process over the 15 years time window towards 2030. Uh, much uh, knowledge and methods were available and could be put into practice, but some translation into practice remains difficult. But we also need to look at the future beyond 2030, because in 2030 the targets will not be met, as has been said this morning by the first keynote speaker. And so I think that in the, uh, the message to the uh, conference next year in New York is not only how we can help towards 2030, but also how we can organize to improve ourselves all together towards the future, even the future whatever it is, whenever it is translated in a new United Nations uh, uh, roadmap for 15 years or more years, or in any, in, in, in any case, how we can uh, put in practice in all the countries. Slide, please. And so, the MDGs were essentially focused on the uh, sanitation and, and, and uh, the drinkable uh, water and the SDGs through SDG number six and all interlinkages has expanded the scope towards the whole hydrology. Slide. And so this, met, this meant that we are dealing with much more complex system with a lot of biophysical complexity, but also socio-hydrological complexity, and issues of dealing with boundaries and interfaces in what we call the critical zone, which is a very fragile uh, depth at the, at the surface of the, of, the, of the earth. Slide, please. And so much knowledge from the past could be used to better understand that and act in that setting, but new knowledge has to be developed in order to progress into that understanding and assessment, and also in order to understand how change has developed in the driving, uh, driving forces and in the uh, hydrological system across the past, it is a trajectory issue, and towards the future, towards possible futures, uh, develop, depending on how the whole complex system will evolve and how uh, uh, the mankind uh, can um, control some patterns in that complex system in the coming years and, 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 and decades. Slide, please. So science and knowledge is um, needed and our task as academic and scientist, slide please, uh, is to reinforce the understanding, the process, uh, the, the, the understanding and the assessment, but also uh, to help us projecting into the future. And the problem is even more complex because the change is not linear. As said this morning, uh, much of the changes are exponential. Uh, it has been uh, called the Great Acceleration. It has been assessed by um, the uh, ICSU program IGBP and recently updated in the, in the paper, which is uh, noted at the bottom. And this Great Acceleration made the, driving, the changes in the driving processes, forces, very complex and the interaction between different variables and compartments potentially divergent, colliding, uh, uh, etc. Slide, please. So the issue of change, accelerating change, exponential change, makes the whole system brand new with new uh, uh, systemic risk as displayed in the regular uh, risk report 
of, of uh, the World Economic Forum, like displayed here in 2020, where we can see from year to year that water is coming to the center of the, of the sphere, and up to the re very recent, three weeks ago, uh, uh, document by ISC, International Science uh, Council on Systemic Risk. I advise you the reading that document uh, recently available. Slide, please. So I'm here only confirming many things which have been said since this morning from the keynotes to uh, Eric who was speaking uh, about education and capacity building, meaning that we, are, we have to be hydrologists focusing on our, on our objects and topics, but we also have to deal with the complexity inherent and in the driving forces and all the interactions. So uh, there are many epistemic challenges. AHS as, an, as a learned society is organized to deal with all these epistemic challenges in terms of process, I will not go into the details, this is for the records, but all the process dynamics, associated processes and fluxes with water, catchment and system integration, we are doing that for decades, but we have to improve and we are working on that. And uh, uh, even more and more and more variability change and co-evolution of the variables and, and, and compartments. Changes, pl uh, slide please. So beyond the epistemic challenges about understanding and assessing, there are also methodological challenges. Science and technology and innovation work together. It has been seen in the past and it remains, it remains uh, the, 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 the engine of our, of, our, of our job. And we are also organized in the association and in the partnerships to develop about the, to, to work on the, and progress on the methodological challenges. Observation and assimilation of different kind of data, modeling in changing systems, bridging the gaps and going until the service delivery, uh, um, downscale the general understanding towards different contexts, and capitalize uh, and synthesize uh, fragmented knowledge bits into a wider understanding in order to better understand in retrospective and in prospective trajectories. Slide, please. So in order to address th this, AHS is an association uh, as a network uh, of people who are touching all these topics in very different settings, but we are trying to facilitate the community effort with prospective exercise. Taikan has spoken this morning about Hydrology 2020, for instance, uh, but also about agenda setting initiatives where we bring, where we encourage people young people to identify the same scientific questions and then to, to facilitate the meta-analysis, the, the synthesis, the comparison, etc. We had the Prediction and Engage Basin uh, initiative. Now we are finalizing the Pantari uh, initiative about change. And we have recently facilitated the worldwide agenda setting uh, um, uh, initiative and paper uh, called Unsolved Problems in Hydrology, which is now cascading into many uh, funding agency programs and calls, and which we have all seen has cascaded into the new strategy of IHP. And so we are organizing uh, the scientific community in order to progress on these questions. You are organizing the multilateralism of, of, of the IHP uh, setting around uh, part of these unsolved problems in hydrology, and so we have a lot to do together. We, all, we have also developed some working groups on, on, on new techniques, citizen and hydrology, etc. What I want to point here is that we are all already working on, operation, on the operationalization of open science, referring to the recent UNESCO uh, um, um, declaration of course of open data publications in order to facilitate comparison, multi-level interfacing understanding. But we, uh, it also means that operational uh, open science uh, uh, implies that we remain inclusive, we remain uh, active in facilitating uh, um, people from all across the world participating to the dynamics, to the conferences, etc. We are working on that. And we also have all together to fight against the publish and perish um, syndrome in order to recognize the efforts of some scientists to work on education and service delivery and not only on publications which sometimes nobody reads.
<laughs> and so uh, we are in strong partnership since the beginning with mm, strong partners, in particular UNESCO, WMO, and in UN Water, with uh, sister learned societies like uh, the ones uh, who spoke this morning. And uh, this is what I call the convolution, because the partnership is very, uh, very convoluted in different type of projects, of actions, of events, on de deliverables, in particular publications, etc. Just to finish, slide please. What I uh, as the question is, what shall we convey as messages to the conference next year in New York? I think we have to find messages for the immediate future in order to accelerate the translation of science into action uh, towards the 2030 horizon, but also to explain everybody that science needs time, that we are dealing with complex system, that we are dealing with accelerating change, and that we already have to work and align and increase efficiency towards science for the future beyond 2030. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe, uh, for your uh, intervention. Indeed, IEHS is now celebrating 100 years played an instrumental role <coughs> in the establishment of international hydrological decade as well as international hydrological program. So it's an agenda setting um, process is really helping us, but also 2023 Water Conference. Next, we move to Professor Anne Van Grievesen. You, you're okay. You Thank you, Anil. I also have some slides. If you can please upload them. So um, I'm Anne Van Grievesen. I'm from the Free University Brussels (VUB) and also IG Delft. And I'm also progressing with the establishment of a UNESCO Chair on Open Water Science and Education. Um, so I'll briefly give some uh, my reflections on what is needed. Uh, so I will start with uh, the next slide, please, where I refer to the keynote of Professor Andras Solzhenitsyn, where we know that there is an exponential curve uh, related to climate change, and this will impact our lives. And if we see uh, look, for instance, at how it will impact someone from sub-Saharan Africa, uh, a, a boy or a girl that is uh, born in 2020. Then, next slide, please. Then we see that some of the risks will be increased by almost 40 times when we look at, at heat waves, but also a multiplication for floods and droughts and crop failures. And all these risks are associated with water. So water plays a key component in the risks for many people, next generations. This boy or girl will be 10 years in 2030 and problems will not be solved. And this is only for a very optimistic scenario of an increase of 1.5 degrees. Next, please, next, next. You can go a little bit. Next, next, next. Thank you. Okay, so um, first of all, what do we need? We need information about these risks. What I showed now is has a, an accuracy that you can maybe present it for sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, but still the current science is not providing a lot of information, not even at country level. So we need to improve our impact assessments, our hydrological models, so that we can provide information that is needed to know what are the problems that are in front of us. And we need higher resolution. We need also better represent the human interactions because our hydrological models as to date are not enough representing, for instance, uh, human uses, irrigations and so on. So that's where we will need to go in the future. And this, of course, also with the groundwater component in there. And finally, it's, it's important to have all this information, but then we have to bring it towards uh, decision making. And for this, we also need to link uh, the information that we can calculate based on models to frameworks such, such as already dis discussed the uh, CREDA framework, but also to solutions like we already discussed the nature-based solutions. Next, please. So this is all more related to the modeling, but another element that has already been discussed this morning are the data gaps. Um, and, and for that, we really need to go to the open science and also the open data, uh, open access, and so on. And for that, we need to harmonize the way we 
collect the data, but also the way we, we provide the data. Um, and there are lots of new technologies that can help us in, in collecting more data, such as Internet of Things and remote sensing. But also there, we have to find a way to bring all these data to, together and uh, to harmonize. And then there are a couple of gaps, of course, that are really uh, needed to, to tackle. And I'm just mentioning a few. Water quality, there hardly is no data on water quality, especially in, not in, in global data sets. Uh, again, uh, human interactions, we have uh, observations of flow, but there are far not many observations or data on who's using the water and how much is he or she using. Uh, what are the abstractions? All these data is not yet um, well available. Um, and then we also, once we have all these data, we have to find new approaches to combine all these data sets. Artificial intelligence is a way, but we probably also need to go in more hybrid approaches where we combine different sources of data, but also different sources of models. Next, please. Okay, and this is just to illustrate the data gaps. Um, there are, for instance, this is a global data set for water quality, and you see that the data are not equally distributed uh, across the globe. Next, please. And the next one is showing some results that has been done on analyzing how river flows have been changed over the past and trying to, to find out whether that's more human or climate driven. And also here you see that this study has not been equally spread throughout um, the globe. And this, with this, I just want to illustrate how important it is that we put all these data together so that no region is left behind when researchers do this type of uh, analysis. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, you have raised a very pertinent issue, climate risk assessment and um, climate risk informed decision analysis, one of the flagship methodologies we developed with the category two center has been applied in many places. But of course, uh, use the open science, open science based on open science recommendation and using uh, internet of things and, and also including citizens in data collection probably will address some of the data gap, but let's move on. Um, Next, uh, Masej Zaleski, uh, who has been recognized as somebody who brought uh, nature-based solution and eco-hydrology approach to UNESCO. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to refer to this very inspiring lectures by Professor Andra Shaloshinaji and uh, Taika Noki this morning. And I think every, every agree with this picture, the water is central element of sustainable future we want. And if so, we have to change the business as usual approach in three dimensions. First, we have to create new vision. Second, new strategy. And third, tactic operational level. And I will try to explain how. I will try. Of course, assuming this brainstorming and can be somehow criticized. So first, vision. I think we have to change the paradigm of water management. Up to now, water management was focused on providing the water to users, preventing the flood, sometimes compensating the, the drought. And we have to now change because if we agree on these two pictures together, water is central, the water management enterprise are expensive, long term, and besides affecting other area of sustainability. Which area? That's why we have to combine now improvement of water quantity quality with improvement of bioproductivity and biodiversity. Why? Because we already reduce by half the biomass of ecosystem in the world. And, and ecosystems are retaining system, pumping system, purifying system for water. So it's extremely important for this. And this was completely neglected aspect. That's why W, second word, B, bio, bioproductivity, biodiversity, because bioproductivity is bioeconomy. Now we, European Commission saying that this is our future. We have to bi develop bioeconomy, but without biodiversity, no way to do it. So. Third one, we have these two 
BMW, we have provide ecosystem services for society and optimize them. If we have this tree, we can develop systemic approach for adaptation to climate change. So W, B, S, R. This is synonym and always such acronym is determined of way of our thinking and our thinking determine acting. So that's why we have to really say water managers, please, if you want to improve water resources, remember that you must also what? Participate in development transdisciplinary science, also contact the eco-hydrologists, contact the, the guy from ecosystem services, sociologists and so, economists and so on. So this is transdisciplinary science, which really is a key of IHP9, because it's not only integrating different discipline, this is inter interdisciplinary science, but also translating in innovative solution and systemic solution, focused on specific demand of given society, given catchment. And that's why transdisciplinarity is so important there that we have to somehow again to use it. And next, we have already this new paradigm. However, if you look such broad scope of OS aspect, we cannot implement this without societal involvement. That's why we have to say plus C and E, culture and education. And this moment we have acronym, which really telling us, putting us very high level of to jump, but we are able to do it, especially who? UNESCO, because has a science, has a education and has a culture. And that's why this is appropriate for the mission of this organization. So that's new paradigm. And now I think the strategy, if we want really convince the decision makers and also involve society, we have to create, and again by UNESCO, culture of water and sustainability. Culture, water and sustainability. People start, must start to identify themselves with this. Okay? And finally, I think if we already going this way, we're coming to tactical operational level, how to do it? Tactical, I would say already, Professor Kudanet mentioned foresight. When having opportunity, thanks to UNESCO, to see as a Darwin many places in the world, I have seen that the water managers showing me the problem to solve here and how to solve and saying, show me the map of catchment, show me distribution of, of urbanization, terrestrial ecosystem, agricultural land, and after that we will start to solve it. And the beside only temporal dimension, tell me what are plans, because if through the catchment highway will be built and highway will immediately attract the industry and other type of activity, they will be completely different. That will be area where you have a biosphere reserve and you will have a tourist development. So all the strategy investment has to be related to the foresight of the catchment like fundamental. Otherwise, this is, I observe many wasting of money without uh, analysis what can happen in the future. And finally, I think the, the most important, that all of this is necessary to increase cost efficiency because in the world is not too much money for water and environment. So we have to build hybrid system because only nature-based solution based on the, in very condensed impact have no chance to solve the problem. And this hybrid system are uh, very efficient. And I will now show this slide, which is here. This is a system which is sequential filtration system, which is constructed for purification water, uh, storm water in the city. This is not constructed wetland. Because why? Because I have seen the constructed wetland need two, three percent of the space catchments uh, area of the catchment in the city is impossible. And by mimicking natural process, which we investigate of self-purification in river, so completely nutrient spiraling and related processes, we reduce the space to 0.3% 
And if you see, maybe they will show the results. Efficiency is much higher than constructed wetland because redox potential is not changing so much. Can I one click? Good. Okay. So we will, of course, put some geochemical barriers, so on. If you want the detail, I recommend, oh, you see, there is a, on the beginning is the dirty water on the left coming. Of course, sometimes storm water, very high concentration, suspended matter on the left. And this just outflow is like mountain stream. So this is use understanding of hydrological pulses, condensing stage, dilution stage and translation in the biological processes and combining in very compact system. The more detail I recommend this ecohydrology, hydrobiology journal when we publish, of course, all the scientific background of this. So second slide. Next one. Oh, okay, coming. And this is an example of hybrid system when we had no space. And in this moment, there was a very high concentration of stormwater from road parkings. There was here something like uh, 100 uh, suspended matter was probably 150 milligrams. And going first, we use typical uh, separators to trap for trapping sand and, and oil from the cars. And next, we build up the kind of horseshoe in the system with two geochemical barriers, some additional solution, plant barrier, and we reduce 20 times. And you see, before the system, it was thought permanent, toxic algal bloom, and now we can count the stones on the, on the system. So this is showing that combining and enhancing engineering solution with nature-based solution is giving cost extremely low. Yeah? Next one. The last one. Okay, and now this is, uh, I'm, I'm today uh, accompanied by Deputy Director of UTC, Professor Edita Kiedrzyńska. Edita is, is here and she just is a very ambitious lady and she took, took the idea of the sequential refrigeration system because, and she found analyzing efficiency sewage treatment plant, the smallest one are the worst smallest medium and she adapted the system to purify for purification for improvement efficiency small few thousand people huge treatment plant and efficiency is really fantastic when the water flow was stable the reduction of phosphorus 70 percent was primarily purified sufficient. and purification of the nitrogen over 90 percent of course there was no stabilization point, so in this moment the pulses were too high because the, the investor didn't accept it. And that's why average is a little lower, eh? but still showing great potential of using this nature-based solution for very low cost. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zalewski, for presenting several approaches, uh, nature-based uh, solutions, uh, different methodologies in details. But one of the key words that I have picked up is develop culture of water and sustainability. Culture, water and sustainability. I think this is something that we really need to build up on that. Now we will move to our uh, panelists uh, who is joining us from Turkey. Uh, Nilay Dogulu, who recently, by the way, wrote a blog in uh, European Geo as Union Society, Geophysical Society. So she's really, she understand what IHP community needs from early career scientists like her. Nilay, over to you. Thank you. Uh, Anul, thank you. Uh, I would like to show you one single slide during my five minutes intervention. Uh, maybe if could to start off by saying that the last and uh, the first and the last UN Motor Conference was uh, 10 years before I landed on Earth. So next year is thus very exciting to me. And the first time I, I met, I heard about IHP was 11 years ago when I worked at the International Hydrological Activities section of State Hydraulic Works in Turkey. As a civil engineer turned into a hydrologist with research roots, I also had the opportunity to observe the practice side. 
at the national and international scale. And during my career, I had many opportunities to observe uh, different contexts that uh, concern hydrology. Uh, let it be regarding drought risk management or let it be operational flood forecasting or let it be data-driven modeling using unsup unsupervised methods for uh, hydrological forecasting. So uh, I have this mixed background giving me the which enabled me to think about to to reflect on the uh, gaps and opportunities. So in this slide, I try to summarize what I see as an outsider, not as a researcher, not as a, uh, a consultant engineer, but just a regular person, as a regular person. The nexus of science practice policy, it's there. And each actors uh, from each one of these sectors have their own needs and expectations. Uh, scientific conferences, these are, uh, are expressed. In such events organized by UNESCO or WMO, these are expressed by the stakeholders at the national scale, at the regional scale. But what, what's maybe uh, still missing is these black triangles, right? I would like to make the analogy here, like black holes. These black squares, black holes, are like where the processes are happening, how the nexus is built up and the action takes place. Solutions are produced, uh, policies are uh, developed, um, strategies are defined as in the IHP 9 vision, but these are very early career scientists especially, these processes are very away from us. We are not familiar with what's happening in these black holes, in these black squares. So um, I would like to emphasize the early career perspective uh, in my intervention. Uh, and the potential I see is here in these black holes, involving early career hydrologists, particularly scientists, if we are talking about uptake of, uptake of scientific research and innovation, it should be these black holes where early career hydrologists, scientists should be involved. We need to hear, we need to listen, we need to uh, express our ideas, share our opinions and sit together with you in the, on, around the same table and help you, uh, guide you in some places even, because uh, not, I'm not even an early career scientist anymore. Like um, time is moving fast and the research universe is expanding so rapidly. There is so much happening in uh, machine learning, in nature-based solutions, in flood risk management, social hydrology, uh, catchment hydrology. So many people from the research part are producing knowledge. They are trying, testing, sharing the results, trying to improve their understanding. But when it comes to um, translating these to the, moving these perspectives, understandings to these black squares, there is a missing link, probably, uh, especially uh, when it, when it uh, comes to uh, hearing the perspectives of early career scientists. So uh, probably more exposure of early career scientists uh, will be uh, valuable. At least it's worth trying out. And so uh, I think this is the main uh, take home message I would like to uh, uh, tell today. Thanks for the, for the uh, this for this opportunity. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Nila. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, indeed, innovative ideas are born. Um, uh, the the fantastic 
innovation are done by early career scientists. I mean, they have to produce. So, of course, the black hole that you have shown us, uh, we really need to integrate those, those enthusiasm, those questions, so that we can find a better solution. Let's move on. Now we will move to La Paz, Bolivia. Uh, with the next panelist, Magali Garcia. She recently collaborated with us also to understand uh, climate change scenario in the context of indigenous knowledge system. Uh, and and uh, we are in the process of producing a publication. But over to you, Magali, for your inter initial intervention. Thank you, Neil. <clears throat> I hope you can listen to me. Is that OK? Yes, yes, we can see you. We can hear you. OK, thank you. Well, uh, thank you. And uh, certainly as scientists, we are to follow the basic equation of weather balance. That's what we learn. Weather precipitated needs to be optimized and we are urged to reduce evapotranspiration. However, this simple mathematics is hard for advanced researchers as well as hardly impact citizens and water users. Uh, we must know that, for instance, urban citizens conceive water as a service. It's not the same for all users. And therefore, research and strategies for water savings should respond to that vision. Experience of extra dry periods show that citizens agree to utilize technology oriented to reduce water consumption by using domestic water sensors to be aware and reduce utilization and record the data as citizen science. Households sensitive to water bills could respond well to community water -based saving strategies, we know. Citizens, uh, we know that, are also sensitive to psychological effects of their urban environment. And much more after the pandemics, we must consider that. And health issues are now addressed differently. Innovation could provide, for instance, which to, with tools to avoid the heat island effect in urban centers, which are a really worrying uh, most uh, urban populations. But regarding rural, mostly indigenous people and small scale farmers, for certain, we know uh, uh, when we talk to them, they are aware that despite a large tradition of integration with the ecosystem, from which they are convinced that we human beings are part of, they know that their local knowledge needs support for ex from external of or internal innovations. Because many of the use strategies either do not work as well as before, do not work at all in, in some cases, but still some of them quite work quite well. And here the question comes on how and which actions could be applied by our si science, by our Western science in an active exchange with ancient societies and rural local communities. Maybe we as scientists could start precisely with the basis of science, which is curiosity and open mind. It's very nice that early career researchers should think on that. Um, we must be aware that traditional observations, for instance, do not occur at random. Our atmosphere and the ecosystem have the physical bi biological basis that follow la laws and self-regulation. When observers look for a signal, this is not enchantment, this is not magic. It is ex the expression of some previous atmospheric or oceanic events that occurred in a chain. Observers does, does not observe, does not know the physical events, but he or she is well aware of the probability of a given outcome. And we need to talk with them. We need to, to understand this. Also, we uh, might think that science has developed innovation oriented to save water and maximize efficiency, as, as we know, as we were told to do. But maximizing and efficiency are words that partly led us to, to the situation we are now, now in. In many cases, they are useful, but in others, they are too utilitarian. Because ecosystems cannot be maximized without compromising sustainability, we know that. While innovation and technology in large agricultural schemes use water to maximize production and efficiently use resources, we also know that rebound effects are very common. And the expensive innovations to save agriculture, agricultural water use are often used to open new irrigated areas, so there's no net gains. Also, <coughs> while precision agriculture is well received in large homogeneous fields, it faces difficulties in small heterogeneous plots, which hold the large agrobiodiversity. Here, this is not an appropriate option. And instead, maybe cheap, small, easy to use, and to read the sensors 
could support local far farming innovators. And there are a lot of innov innovators, I must say. Also, locally dependable weather information and forecast could be of more use than sophisticated extreme events early warning. It's useless to have very nice warning uh, uh, data if we don't know what to do with that data. Frost comes and farmers do not have enough inputs to respond to that. It's better to have dependable weather information. Research is needed to on innovative strategies to maintain water in soil, such as the use of polymers, and they are already being revised by, the sm by a small scale farmers who are, who are also innovators in our lands. Circular economy principles, I, I heard about bioeconomy. This is very important and we can use it to water management, looking for water circularity in, in seasonally concentrated rainy areas. Looking to avoid most surface losses as did the, in the ancient Amunas in the Andes, for instance, using up, upstream rock fractures to recharge aquifers downstream, maybe in mountains environments, for instance. Water quality is also a large concern for everyone, but more for populations in remote, scarcely monitored areas, which are mostly uh, occupied by indigenous people, as well as in peri-urban zones, where only highly polluted water is available as a result of competing activities such as mining or large agricultural, agricultural systems. Innovations as, such as nanotechnology or biotechnology or what uh, like, uh, the, the ones that I saw before could support users to receive clean water whose previous users uses cannot be controlled like mining or under no other option or scenario. Also, tropics where most indigenous people work are rich in solar energy, largely composed by UV uh, light. Science could bring appropriate innovation to use this energy to disinfect water as, as do many, many uh, farmers and provide a small rural communities with clean drinking water sources without increasing the carbon footprint. Um, finally, uh, I was aware to, of five minutes uh, limit. Research and innovation need to be locally developed, we know it. But most scientists and innovators from developing countries do not have access to updated information because we do not, we do not have access to half of the journals they are paid. UNESCO could contribute to the diffusion of science, providing regionally and globally access to some of this information, at least to metadata or to the reviews, because we need this information, but we don't have. Finally, governance is key for, for success of any water-related action. Organizational social research is necessary to take advantage of social behavior in order to, to motivate the uptake of water-saving strategies. But for this, we need a key-shaped professional instead, instead of T-shaped professionals, especially in one area, but well trained in the others, especially socially related to develop and postulate actions that we hope are scientifically feasible, ecosystem, ecosystemically friendly and culturally acceptable. Thank you very much, Anil. Thank you, Magali. Thank you for reminding us uh, that uh, the, the methodology, the approach that we develop or try to enhance needs to be based on that can be used in the local conditions. Uh, uh, no matter whether fancy model, uh, if that cannot be used, uh, there is no use of that. But also open science, yes, uh, the o UNESCO's open science recommendation calls for open access, open hardware, open software, and we are trying to uh, really work with uh, member states, uh, scientific community to enhance the, that aspect. Thank you very much. Now we move to uh, Dr. Mark Smith, who is a Director General uh, International Water Management Institute, perhaps he can provide insight from the image perspective how uh, this community needs to bring scientific aspect to Water Conference 2023. Mark, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Anil, um, and thank you to, to yourself, Anil, and to Abu and um, and the, the IHP program for the opportunity to join you in this uh, in this session today. Um, so as you said, I'm the Director General of the International Water Management Institute. Um, we are a research for development organization. I'm sure familiar to a good number of people in the room. Um, and the vision of, of IMI is a water secure world. Um, and so I hope 
very much that the work that we do at IMI uh, complements and aligns with the, the, the fantastic program that's been outlined in the IHP 9 strategic program um, and its ambitions for science for a water secure world, which I'll come back to. Um, we've seen and uh, uh, appreciate very much the contributions and presentations from the other panelists that, that we've just heard from. Um, and I hope that what I will uh, say in my few remarks is it will, will um, complement what, what's been said. And my starting point is, as has been mentioned by several of our speakers, that water risks are changing because of climate change. Um, and I think we, we all acknowledge that water risks are changing and growing at a rate uh, that conventional means of organizing and coordinating our science, organizing and coordinating water science can't keep up with. Um, and that's what they are, in a, in a certain sense, that's what the recent IPCC reports tell us. Um, that the frequency and severity of water-related disasters is increasing, water risks are growing, uh, but uncertain the, the events, the water-related extreme events that we've seen unfold in, in, in 2021 and, 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 and in this year, that, that in, in, in a sense they are a warning of what's to come. And all of these changes, they compound the growing pressures on water security because of for example, urbanization and environmental degradation and water pollution and so on. Again, things that other speakers have touched upon. Um, so therefore we have to ask what we as a water science community need to do differently. And alongside that, there's also the issue I'd like to raise of fragmentation. So water systems and finding solutions for water security are, are, are complex and locally very diverse. And Magali's uh, presentation just now, I think, um, uh, very uh, eloquently articulated that issue of local diversity and complexity. And there are scale effects in water systems that mean that different, there are different priorities for science, for data and for action at different scales in the places that we work, in the places that we do our science. And there are multiple institutions, sometimes overlapping, um, very often overlapping, and that's kind of the norm in the water world. Um, so where does science and innovation fit? The UN, the intergovernmental organizations, my own institution, IMI, national, uh, national research institutions, universities, consultancies, the private sector, all produce data uh, models. They all um, uh, help to drive innovation and they all work on attempting some level of coordination. Um, <clears throat> so in asking ourselves, what do we need to do differently in asking and then uh, recognizing that in doing that we need also to address this issue of fragmentation of our efforts. Um, a critical challenge is given the severity and the real urgency of what a challenge is um, as we look forward to 2030 and we look forward to, 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 to the time beyond, how do we get better coordinated, ensure that we're focused on the top priorities and in the right places. How do we get, how do we ensure that in doing that, we're able to move science, data, and digital innovation into policy and practice and into action that really makes a difference. Um, and the IHP 9 strategic plan is, is critically relevant and important uh, to that challenge. Um, and it provides a means of mobilizing coordination and critical joint action among the water science community. But I advocate we need to do more. We need to do more to overcome what could be, given the urgency and severity of the water challenge at large, to overcome what could be overwhelming fragmentation of our efforts. And how do we then mobilize the water science community and other sectors to help solve these most critical problems and try to catch up with the forces that are undermining achievements and progress on water security, as I outlined before. So therefore, how can we, as the water science community, work closely with the policy community, the business community, the development community, and engage across sectors, engage Global South and Global North, uh, put youth at the center of that dialogue as uh, Nile uh, advocated for, um, to build a water science agenda that supports action on, on Agenda 2030 and SDG 6, at the scale and at the speed needed, recognizing that that 
that that scale and speed is unprecedented for our community. <clears throat> How can we do that in a way in which we as a science community contribute effectively and catalytically to acceleration of SDG 6 um, and, and building on the SDG 6 acceleration framework and its components, which are highly relevant to what we talk about data, innovation, governance, capacity building, financing. So at IMI, with, with my colleagues here and some, some other organizations, we've been putting our minds to this and we've been developing what we call uh, a Science for a Water Secure World initiative to convene science, knowledge and data users, so that from the public and private sector, as well as the scaling actors who can scale uh, uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, speed and, and, and the rate of progress, to discuss priorities for water science and join action across the science, policy, business and development communities on this agenda. And I hope that this initiative, as I say, which is it's something we are organizing ourselves and, and have been having a few discussions about. And so I welcome the opportunity to raise this here, also with a view to, to, to 2023 and what comes beyond. So I hope that the dialogue that we uh, uh, hope to build will complement and strengthen the ambitions between IHP9 and ourselves and multiple stakeholders uh, and partners, because those are ambitions that we all we all share. Um, so maybe just a couple of quick final comments then looking forward to the 2023 conference um, and the kinds of messages that we need to be taking into that. Um, I think the key point here is that the needs from water science going forward from 2023 and towards 2030 and beyond, the needs from water science are enormous. Um, the changes in water risks um, and, the, and the way those are outpacing progress on building water security, um, the fact that uncertainty is growing and climate is, 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 is um, changing how we should work on water security. We have to recognize that the, and convey through the conference that the needs from water science are enormous. So therefore, can we as a water science community and the key stakeholders that I've been mentioning can we mobilize uh, to, to emerge out of the 2023 con uh, conference, joint programs to catalyze innovation with urgency, and that drives action at scale, and thereby in the run up to 2023, challenge ourselves to say, how can we do that, given the enormity of the problems and the challenges that flow forward from here? Back to you, Anil, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for recognizing uh, the IHP9 contribution, but also uh, the mirroring of uh, science for a water secure world that uh, you outline IMI's vision. And I, I think there is a great potential between IMI and UNESCO to develop synergy between these two initiatives. Uh, in other words, ISP implementation plan is already approved by member states. So there is a great potential that we need to work together uh, so that uh, member states can benefit um, uh, from, from our joint effort. And also, thank you very much for raising this uh, scaling uh, issues, the, the actors that needs to be engaged in. I would like to request our interpreters to uh, allow us to go until 4 p.m. for this session, uh, so that uh, maybe the closing remark, we can go after 4 p.m. I hope that will be acceptable to our interpreters. Uh, because we, we are catching up with, uh, with the, the delays uh, from the first session. Um, so with that request to interpreter, I have not put in my headphone, I think that's okay. Okay. Um, my colleague will come down and, and see you. I don't know if you, somebody has the headset on, but my colleague will come down and see you, our team leader. But before that, we would like to go back to our keynote speaker, who is also serving as a panelist. So let's have uh, his reflection on these uh, science questions that we put forward, uh, but also his reflection based on what we have heard from the panelists. Taikan, you have the floor. Thank you, Anil. And uh, yeah, while you're thinking about your question, I will take some time to reflect that the, what we have been discussing. 
And I was given that the 10, 12 minutes in the morning, so I, I have nothing to add. But listening to that, the discussion till the first speaker of the first panel discussion till that just before me, that the, of course, the science can provide knowledge for proper and efficient policy making and its implementation. However, sometimes we are reluctant to accept new knowledge or that to follow the scientific suggestions. It could be, I, I, it's very, you know, uh, delicate to tell it about the policy makers. Sometimes they, they have their own value and they will, I feel personally, they were more reluctant than us to accept new knowledge or the new way of the management of water. So how can we overcome such a barrier? Maybe we need to have the mutual trust and the collaboration and interactive, and interactive communication, frequent communication will help develop mutual trust through the social uh, science policy interfaces. And uh, for the open science, yes, also that would be efficient to nurture the empathy and mutual trust among the stakeholders. And uh, for the citizen science, I think that we need to provide more opportunities for students and children to get their own discoveries or new inventions. Even from that professional researcher's perspective, they may not be quite new. However, less they have the experience, they found they have discovery or they have in some innovations by themselves, then they can have more understanding what the researchers or the academic community has been doing. And about the UNESCO Water Family and IHP Secretariat, you are expected to stimulate and uh, encourage scientists in the member states or the not in the member state to actively participate in the discussion, the real research in their own expertise on also the interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary researches. Christoph uh, articulated academic researchers should be free from the publisher parish. Sorry that I make noise. <laughs> yeah. But the two, to realize that, that the, to support the movement toward that direction, we as a community have to appreciate academic activities that contribute to make the world better in the reality, not the, you know, only the philosophy or the ideas or that the scientific papers, but for that the stimulate the real actions in the society. And, uh, and not only that, you know, one fixed way, but in various and diverse ways, and especially by the early career scientists, as the uh, Nilay pointed out. And message to the UN World Conference 2030 and 2023, I think that the Anil or that the IHP should say that the UNESCO will promote water science for people and water science by people. How does it sound like? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Taikan, for providing a, a sort of a key motto, water science for people, water science by people. Uh, with that, I would like to open the floor for questions to panelists. Um, please come forward, either uh, from, uh, yeah, please come forward. Yes, uh, Mikhail. What is the difference between science for people and science by people? What is the difference between two sciences? Okay, what is different between science for people and science by people? Yeah. Taikan, would you like to respond? Well, sorry that English is not my native language, but my understanding is science for people is do the science to enrich the people, physically or mentally, or maybe the society would be better. And science by people, it, uh, let, it's open science, I mean. So that let the 
not only the academic community will promote, do the science, but the share the activities of scientific activities with the society, do it together with the stakeholders. I mean, that is science by people. Thank you, uh, Taikan. I think it also reflects citizen science, uh, developing scientific methodology, validating through uh, engagement of citizens. Um, uh, Magali from uh, Bolivia was also highlighting understanding the process that community understands. Uh, so probably this is what uh, was highlighted. I see Nilay wants to come in, please. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, science for people, to me, it means uh, value producing science research that will of value of societal value that will address um so the challenges related to water resources management uh, providing practical value so it's not doing science like theoretically wonderful super very deep uh, enjoyable but uh it's, uh, it's, it's doing research that can be translated to services, uh, whether uh, climate water services, for example, uh, flood and drought forecasting systems, uh, early warning platforms, etc. cetera. Uh, Anil? Thank you very much. Magali, would you like to come? Yes, please. Yes, if I might uh, jump in, sorry. Um, I think uh, science for people is what we have been doing. So we think what people need and we go and we are very good uh, hydrology and water related researchers. Uh, and we have doctorates and postdoctorates and we produce science. But people re do not want or do not, do not agree or agree partially to apply our results. But when people develop and express their needs, it is much more um, probable that they will use our results. So I think it's not uh, good to be a fundamentalist. I'm not fundamentalist of local and indigenous knowledge, for instance, but I really enjoy interpreting it and being that it's coherent. And that, uh, for instance, um, adaptation, we were talking, uh, we are talking about adaptation about 10 years ago, more or less, but farmers, at least in the, where, where I work and where I work at, have been adapting to climate change, I, at least since the last Mega Nino, 1993, which was really hard for the Andes and they shifted. So maybe we might uh, listen farmers, to, we might see, we might try to understand what they, 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 they need what they, they want. They are innovators as well. So I think that's the difference between science for people and science by people. But as I said, it's not a fundamentalism, please. We, I think we need all levels of information and science and technology. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for bringing further clarity uh, of the needs of, of a community that we are working for. Uh, I would like to ask for one final question uh, to the panelists. If you can identify, yes, sir. Please identify yourself also. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Kalistin Mugaya, my name is Vice uh, uh, Chair, IHP Council representing Africa. I think from this discussion, Zarot has been talked about the challenges of developing countries, especially Africa. A number of things we notice that uh, we are losing professionalism, especially in the hydrological field. Sometimes we ask ourselves whether we still have hydrologists. Many of the people really are struggling with the data collection, data analysis, interpretation, and decision making. And I was wondering what could be done in view of the experiences from the rest of the world. How can IHP help in this area? And how can other programs help to address this challenge? Thank you. Thank you, Kali. Sorry, you were putting on mask. I could not recognize because of the new system. But of course, yes, Marcel, you want to come in. If I may answer, I think the good example how HP is helping, there is a sort of story of establishing African Center for Ecohydrology at Ministry of Energy, Water Energy in Ethiopia, which recently, because the, let's say, 
somehow success story was upgraded to directorate of ecohydrology. So just UNESCO was founding the stage for the people who come to our center. And of course, to prepare the staff, we also get some money from European Commission for Erasmus Mundus. Poland aid program also provides quarter million of dollar and all this provide chance to build 30 people team because one person never can do it. Huh? And it, with this team, we are coming and building together several demo site. And this, as I, this type, as I example, just show. And on demo site, they, they, they develop and adjust to the local condition in, and solutions. And I think the demo site is best way translate some, let's say, what was postulated this morning, translate some uh, biotechnology, ecohydrological biotechnologies developed here to the African condition, which works much better because you have a, according to Van Hoflau, you know, higher intensity of process. So if well, well tuning, if you do well tuning to the local condition, efficiency is even better than in a temperate climate. And maybe I will show the slides that you can solve, <clears throat> for example, in Africa, this is prototype done uh, done in uh, in Poland, the, because in, in again inspired by HP, because there was a big problem uh, construction of dams. Big European project Amber was postulating destroy the dam in Europe because it's demolishing the the biodiversity, and of course I said to my colleagues that is not realistic in the face of climate change. You cannot destroy the dams because the river continuum process destroy and this is you see there was a proposition above is solution proposed to to really destroy beautiful white river meandering with beaver otters and so on and build reservoir however the decision maker asked me if we build this reservoir cost the millions uh, to, can, could you tell us if will be toxic algal bloom appearing or not i said after analysis, yes, you have sometimes 800 millimeter, milligrams of phosphorus in flat pulses condensing stage. So if built like this, yes, but I will tell you how to build, to have a reservoir, river with biodiversity and no toxic algal bloom. We propose built reservoir on the side, smaller, and special system which measuring water quality is dilution stage only allowing to the reservoir when it's below 100 micrograms of phosphorus dilution stage. And in this moment, reservoir is fed only periodically, something like 100 days a year. And this condensing stage is going through the river. It's not polluted because the sediments, phosphorus, nitrogen, but, but it's normal process, flat poles. So Thank this you very is much. type of solution which, which we translate to Africa and immediately this worked very well. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Carlis. I just want to also highlight, um, you know, we of course work with the scientific community to understand scientific frontiers. But one of the quotes that I borrow from Will Logan, he says always in his presentation, he didn't make this statement today, what keeps water management manager awake at night? So to provide the solution uh, with uh, Army Corps of Engineers, UNESCO work and develop this climate risk informed decision analysis, which has been used to provide plausible solution in different places in Chile, in South Africa and so on and so forth. Finally, Akisa, yes. final question. Yeah, I think that there is something that uh, from my point of view maybe is missing is really to see how when we talk about all the interlinkages between the different SDGs and how we address this scientifically, how to um, optimize uh, management of uh, resources and governance, how to see, how to territorialize the um, water, agriculture, food, health, culture, and eco economic policies. So how to see, I mean, you know, from a scientific point of view, how we can address this kind of, interf I mean, all the, the science at the interface and the linkages in order to come up with some optimized what I mean water management uh, and governance uh, aspects of for me we are not we, we are not enough addressing these aspects and from the also from the policy point of view I mean this kind of the, to see how the co coherence of these different policies of the territory uh, landscape um, I mean uh, scale I think this is uh, really important to, to address from a, I mean from a research point of view and at the UN conference, it would be important to have this also, I mean, 
to, to look at these aspects more uh, in depth. Th thank you, Akisa, for raising this very pertinent issue. I think in this um, session today, two of the keynote speaker uh, presented a similar uh, cartoon showing water uh, holding centrality of SDGs. But in terms of interlinkages uh, to provide policy feedback, maybe perhaps uh, Taikan or maybe even Andras can come in. Uh, Taikan, would you like to start? Interlinkage between the, the you know many frameworks or the goals. I think that the in IPCC work number two, the latest report released in February, uh, proposed a new terminology: climate resilient development. That here that you know that climate actions like the adaptation and mitigation are not only for the climate uh, to reduce the impacts of the climate change, but it should be in line with the sustainable development and disaster risk reduction and uh, sustainable development. So that now that they, they are, I mean, the climate community is all already aware about that. And the water sector, I think we do. But this is sustainable development people, maybe they will think that, okay, sustainable development only and you know, climate is just one of their target goals and water is one of their goals, but the, they, they are now seeking and uh, doing the research on the trade of the synergies. And uh, do you know that water has some trade-offs uh, with other goals? So we have to do more money. I think it's, if we think from the water climate resiliency, something that really put together I mean, the water and climate yes. aspects and to, to address them, in, in, I mean, from the resilience point of view. I agree. And also IPCC report, the vulnerability part uh, released in February. If you look at uh, the, uh, the scenarios, but also they, they state water holds the centrality for adaptation. This is, I think, very first time it is recognized for adaptation, you have to really consider water. Andres, would you like to come in? Uh, as, as you know, uh, all the SDG goals are equal, but there are some that are more equal than the others, namely the first two. Uh, and I think rightly so. Uh, the, the first goal is to eradicate poverty by the year 2030. That is to say, those fellow human beings who are living under the $1 limit. And the other one, is eradicate uh, hunger by 2030. You know, some people say that these goals are unattainable. No, if you look at how much money we have uh, on the earth, it is staggering, considering that 25% of the food is going to, uh, you know, the food for the, to the you know, waste basket, but also considering that 70% of the wealth of the world is in the hands of eight families. Well, if something is not sustainable, that is not sustainable from a social point of view. Now, if you look at the other 15 goals, apart from perhaps one or two, water is, a, is the key component, definitely in poverty eradication and definitely in, in, in solving the, the food, food crisis. So if not proper attention is given to the water and sanitation goal, Mind you, every single year there are 8 million people who are killed by water. 8 million, uh, which is 3 million more than the COVID, uh, you know, losses. I'm not saying that uh, there's any relativity in between the two. But somehow, humanity and the political community lives with the fact, easy, that there are 8 million people killed by water every single year. And that is a, that is a big deal. And that perhaps our community is not able to send the message loud and, and, and clear enough. Thank you. That is an opportunity to do it. In fact, you know, we have been through COVID. Now we are facing all the problem of, uh, 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 I mean, with, uh, with the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I mean, we see, for example, from my country, I mean, how much we are being impacted from the food aspects. So really there are all these, I mean, uh, problems, issues that we have been facing, and there is a rupture, COVID and now with the conflict. And if we don't take it, I was thinking then even IHP maybe should change the name, its name. 
You know, for example, it should be maybe an intergovernmental, when you see IPCC, maybe the intergovernmental program on, I was thinking water and climate or something that really puts more, you know, because hydrology, I'm sorry, but for me, you know, it doesn't resonate. It is more water, is not food, is not, um, you know, health, is not enough, the economy is not development, is not sustainability. So I'm, I don't know, it, this is, I just express it as I feel it, but I mean, it is something maybe we have to think of in order to put these interlinkages and to make the centrality of water as it should be, of SDG 6, because as I said, we perceive it, but look at other diagrams showing the interlinkages is not there. So we have to, to do some advocacy work in order to push, I mean, water much more, I mean, forward. And we have the opportunity with the next year conference so why don't we do it and, and, and beyond even uh, 2030? Could I add one sentence to that? Because this is a wonderful proposal. I think this has to be taken up by the council tomorrow. The, the climate community was very smart in communicating. We are not. Uh, we are uh, pretty lousy in our media uh, relations. We just cannot make the subject understood by the, by the journalists. Now, uh, the problem with the climate change is not that the temperature is going to be three centigrade higher. This is called vacation. The impacts are important. And the impacts, as, as, as we keep saying, is 80% of the impacts are water related. And that's the message we ought to be able somehow to commit. And no house other than this one, where there is a strong linkage with the political community, can do that. So we need to have uh, the whole water community uh, an aggressive, in the positive sense, an aggressive media policy. How do we sell the drama of water? That's the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, uh, you know, we would have to uh, close this session, but I would like to uh, thank and give a big uh, hand to all the panelists for their excellent intervention. Um, those who are sitting here in the podium, but also from the distance, uh, Magali, Nilay, and Mark, and from panelists here, Anne, Taikan, Christophe, and Masse, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, um, the, this panel session is over now. And I would like to also thank my colleagues, uh, particularly those who are here in the room and all the colleagues who helped to organize this session, and invite uh, Abu to give his closing remark. Abu. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Anil, and uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, dear colleagues, dear participants, for those uh, wonderful uh, hours in the morning, in the afternoon, in discussing this very critical issue of, uh, of water, how to raise the profile, profile of water worldwide within all across sectors. And I really appreciate the last, last part of the discussion and uh, you may recall uh, the report released by the high level panel on water among one of the recommendation i still uh, have it in mind in addition to strengthening the un water there is a recommendation in creating a science panel on water but the, as you rightly put it, Andrash, there's no need to create another new entity. HP is there, is a program of member state, is an intergovernmental, is up to member state to see how to upgrade the program to see to what extent it can cover all the aspects and provide the necessary information in the appropriate way they want to member state. So that advocacy, I totally support it. I think we need to continue doing that advocacy. This, this is one of the reasons we uh, put in place this discussion to push for this big gathering next year on water to make science at the core of all decision making when it's come to water issue. That is really our ambition and we all have to work together all how to convey that message in our constituencies, 
in where uh, in our network. Of course, one of the key challenges we have been facing is that generally, water communities we have been talking among ourselves, as rightly put by many of the, the, the colleagues. We need to go beyond our own communities. We got to connect with the others. So the cross-sectoriality of water is well recognized by practically all the, within all the panel discussions. So we should take forward key messages from these discussions. Now, I, I don't have time to go through because we have only 10 minutes uh, allowed to us by the interpreters. Uh, at least to identify some messages from the different sessions. Uh, starting for this session, I think the key message is that transdisciplinarity. We cannot address in a sustainable way, in a meaningful way, the issue of water resources which are more and more complex. We have seen it with all the accelerations and interlinkages without embracing a transdisciplinary approach of water. And this is exactly what HP9 is advocating. HP9 strategic plan, I recommend all of you to grab one copy. We'll publish, uh, it's already published. Uh, tomorrow we have a, we'll disseminate widely that document, which has, was negotiated among member states of UNESCO. Uh, so this is a document, not only for UNESCO, it's a document for all scientific community who want to work together to help member states of the world to address the issue of water in the world. So we are looking forward, all of you to join us in moving forward, implementing this very ambitious program. So that, that, that intersectorality was has highlighted. Of course, we have all the issues of, uh, of data, the issue of, um, uh, of management, the issue of changing the paradigm, nature-based solutions approach. So all those things are related within the approach of transdisciplinarity. Of course, groundwater was also highlighted. So this is the first big block. The second big block, the knowledge produced shouldn't stay in the academia. No. The knowledge produced will help to shape policies. So this is why we have this science policy interface, so that the knowledge is actionable. That's the key message I think we need to bring forward. All the tools, methodology available within academia, we have the responsibility to make it available, to be operational, so that decision can be taken to solve social issues. That is the message, essential message for the panel two. Of course, we have all the issues related to multi-stakeholders engagement, the youth, the women, the uh, local indigenous knowledge, and so on and so on. But above all, the key message is that how are you taking the knowledge to make it actionable to take decisions to solve problems. The third panel, which is on capacity development, because you cannot address this without well-skilled water professionals, without new conscious people vis-a-vis -vis the relationship to water, all across, from kindergarten to communities to higher education, we need to change the paradigm when it's come to water education and capacity development. And we had the opportunity to, to, to discuss on it, and this is a very, very important missing link also when it's come to issue of water. We have we experienced many examples where water development project put in place at community level, water supply. After one, two years you come, everything is down because it was not accompanied by a building capacity of the community for them to sustain, to manage their own water system, which is a, a, a small thing to add within the, the project. So those are issues which are very critical. And also, when it comes to higher education, we, have, we heard within the panel, we need to have our new generation of water professionals 
having an open mindset. Water is not only putting power plant, the reading wall. No, water is more than that. Water is social, is economic. So those who are trained should have that broader view of water aspect so that they can help member states addressing the issue of water in a sustainable way. So those are the key messages I believe we should put forward. Now, the, the way forward after this meeting is that we have been working with a uh, water future program uh, head by, as you know, uh, uh, Professor and Andrash is, is here with us. Uh, so we will work together using a zero element from the content of these discussions to come out with two sets of documents. So we have one document, which we call uh, Science for SDG 6. And that document, let me see exactly the title so that uh, So we have science for SDG 6, so science towards supporting SDG 6 and other related SDGs. So this will be a set, a document which will be a blueprint of key concrete measures and orientation within that document. And then we'll have another document which will be now on the policy reflecting the interlinkages. So science policy interlinkages. And those documents will be drafted by uh, some committees then will share with all of you those documents and the ambition is to make those documents available for the UN 2020 water conference but we want to have all these communities to to, buy, to to bring on board on those documents this is why we will have a wider dissemination and consultation of those documents uh, before being put forward at the UN 2023 water conference and we uh, we plan to have another conference I, I may I may recall I need me to be in November in November we are planning at that time we'll be advanced in producing those two pieces of uh, very concise uh, uh, documents uh, so that we can have them by uh, uh, considered by all the community so that they can be now put forward uh, within the UN Water Conference. So that will be a kind of our contribution scientific community uh, to that. This is why really we want to, to make it more inclusive, um, to bring on board the largest community we have on the, those, those documents so that it can be not only the document for UNESCO, but it's a community, the document for the all uh, scientific community. So those are issues which uh, we, are, we are putting forward. And I would like really, uh, after this exciting day, to once again thank you for your very fruitful uh, contribution. We have we have more than 20 uh, experts, uh, well-known experts, and we are very grateful for your for your support, for your contribution, and we are looking forward to continue engaging with you, so that really we can make science visible at the UN 2023 Water Conference, because we believe that science is key element of uh, decision making in solving the water uh, issues is not only as many of you highlighted it's not only at the end of 2020 uh, 2030 it has to go beyond that so the uh, the global water pack i don't know you have been following the two uh, uh, custodian of the uh, co-host of the conference the idea is to come out with a kind of um water uh, global water pack because there will be no negotiated documents at the UN Water Conference. So the idea of Tajikistan and uh, Netherlands is to come out with a kind of commitment, which is called a global water pact. So if our two pieces of documents, which will be produ will produced, can be part of that pact, that will be something as we can consider as our contribution. So I want to thank you once again, and to thank all the team uh, uh, coordinated by by the chief of sections in really uh, delivering this um, wonderful day, wonderful uh, discussions. And we are looking forward to see you uh, for the rest of the week because we are starting tomorrow, the 25th ordinary session of IHP, uh, IHP Council. So we want to thank also the interpreters. I think they stay 
uh, with us. Uh, this is this is uh, well appreciated. To thank all the all the, all the colleagues uh, who work tirelessly. Uh, Polina, I don't know, Anil, maybe you can come to see them uh, because you coordinated the team. Uh, so so thank you uh, for, for 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 that, Anil. Thank you, Abu. I just want to recognize uh, the colleagues who really uh, took lead in organizing this event. Uh, Kuhn, can you uh, please? Um, Paulina. Karantan. Uh, uh, Rad uh, Mahmoud. And the colleague, I don't see their sitting. Please stand up. Yes, you. Hiya, yeah, yeah hiya. And also Natasha, Barbara, Hong, who are not here, and all the colleagues from Jorge and all the colleagues from uh, from all the DV sections uh, really contributed to organize this event. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Huh?